Hello there. Welcome to another short video segment. This one is going to describe Faraday's law of induction. And by the time I'm done with this, I want to show the exact same result that we got before when we looked at a loop going into a magnetic field. We described how the motion of that loop would generate a current around the loop. Um, we analyzed that from the point of view of what we call a motional EMF. So it was all about uh, the velocity um, generating some current. But this time we're going to use a different approach, but still get the same result that we got before to describe what causes that current around there. So this one is going to use Faraday's law of induction. And anytime you're asked to use Faraday's law of induction, you should just write the basic relationship, which says that you will generate an EMF. Remember, that's the same kind of EMF that a battery would generate if we were to stick a battery on that loop and make some current flow that way. But this time, it is going to be because we have some changing magnetic flux. That's what the phi sub m means. And it is the rate of change of that flux that generates the EMF. And it, in fact, is actually equal to the value of the EMF. So. First, we have to remember what we mean by flux. So if I rewrite the phi using just the definition of flux, it is some field times some area through which that field is acting. So we can see the B field there. That's indicated by the, the tan little square. And now, what do we mean by area? Well, the area is not the entire area, that 2L by 2L square. And it's also not the area of the loop, the L by L loop. We have to have some flux in order to count for the area. So I'll highlight here the region where we have some area. Um, now, because of my the way this figure is laid out, it doesn't show up very nicely. but what I highlighted there is the only place in that loop where we actually have any magnetic field. So just that little bit would be the area. And if I move it a little further in, then I get to count more of that thing. So it's possible that um, I actually have the entire loop in there and we have the area. But um, in this case, just that, that small little fraction of it. So. Let's take the next step now and describe what's changing about this. Because it's all about change. Well, is the magnetic field changing? Well, no, because the field is just a constant number. Now, you could, in some situations, have a field that changes with time, and then you won't be able to do this. What I'm going to do here is pull out the B. Now, I'm also going to drop the negative sign here because the negative sign thing is kind of a separate issue. Even though it starts in the equation, we're not going to worry about it when we figure out the actual value. So I pull the B out of the integral. I'm sorry, the derivative. And then I'm looking at just the rate of change of that area. OK, well, when you saw me color in the area and as it changed there, why was it changing? It was because there was some rightward motion and I don't have any more vertical area. I just have more horizontal area. So when we write area in a little different way, I'm just showing the whole derivation here. This is the rate of change of the length. Now, this length here is like the height of that little area. And then we have the amount that's actually inside. So I'm going to refer to this area here as x. That's the amount of my loop, just the horizontal amount, that's actually enclosed inside that magnetic field. So I will call this x. So now I need to look at the rate of change of L times x. Now in calculus class, they say, well, when you've got a product of things and you're trying to, to uh, find its derivative, maybe you have to do the product rule. But in this case, not both of those things are changing. The L is not changing. So I will further simplify this by pulling the L out of the equation or out of the uh, derivative. So now I'm left with the rate of change of x dx dt. 
Okay, so I've just pulled everything out that's not changing. Well, what is dx dt? You see, as I move this loop back and forth, I have more and more area actually enclosed there. dx dt is just the velocity of the loop. So I can replace that with v. So b l v describes the EMF generated while it enters. And it will also describe it as it exits. When you can't use this, it is the part where, I'll show you here on the figure, if the loop is entirely inside there, then our area really isn't changing because the entire square has flux through it. So it would be a L times L kind of area. So it's only the part where the flux is changing. And I want to show you what we got here. I told you that I wanted to arrive at the same result using Faraday's law that I got using the Lorenz force in the previous example on a different video. BLV, that is the EMF generated when we move a loop with a height of L um, with some velocity perpendicular to that into a field. So I think that's going to do it for now. And um, I hope this demonstrates that Faraday's law is just as a good approach as the Lorenz force is to solving this kind of question about EMFs making currents flow through a loop.